My name is Josh Gray. I get the privilege uh, of being the lead servant at this church called Real Life on the Palouse. And that means that uh, I get to be made and transformed and molded and help others be made and transformed and molded. And sometimes that happens right in front of your very eyes in here. So I'm ready for today's message. I don't normally walk up with tissues in my pocket, but I do uh, today. And uh, I'd love to be able to tell you like, hey, everything's great. My week was great. It was wonderful and easy. And that would be a big fat lie. I come up here with a heavy heart this week. I come up here uh, a little bit in in mourning. Um, Shocker, if you looked at the notes, what am I teaching on? Uh, Temptation. Um, And so it's been a, I'd love to say like we're the place where we got it all figured out, but this is a church called Real Life. And uh, the staff is not perfect. I've heard that some of you may not be perfect. Um, But God, our Father in heaven, is fully complete and fully perfect. And that's who we're following. And so that's what I love about our church. Um, I love the fact that, that we are here to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time, whether we have a building or didn't have a building, whether we had all of the fancy stuff or we didn't have all the fancy stuff. That's been our, our vision since this church was planted in 2007. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we've, we've had a number of baptisms uh, so far this, in this year, and those people are getting connected and plugged in, and they're being transformed. And our mission, the way that we, uh, what we think we're called to do when somebody accepts and understands the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and invites the Holy Spirit to live in their heart and their life, our next part is we just don't leave them and say, like, cool, got one. Like, that's not what you would do to your, your kids, would you? Oh, cool, you understand that you shouldn't touch, you shouldn't run across the street, so you'll never do it again. I just won't watch you. You're two. No, 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 no. Like, we're walking with them, and as they get older, there's different mistakes and different things that they step on. And so when we talk about making disciples, the way that we see that done is not from a Sunday service. This is a lecture. 5% of our learning is lecture. Is that how you want to be taught your whole life is lecture? It doesn't work for me. I like to step on things and blow stuff up and work and, you know, pick up the pieces and, and feel them in my hands. And so uh, we choose to make biblical disciples the way that we see Jesus did. We don't separate his message, go make disciples, teaching them everything I have. We don't separate his message from his method. Think about it when you read through the text. How many times is Jesus really talking to a giant group of people and how many times is he talking to his guys? So we believe that biblical disciples are made in relational environments and that's a group of you know, eight to 12 people that know what's going on in each other's lives. And so you'll hear us talk about that often. Is he talking about groups again? Yes. Get in a group. So uh, after someone follows Jesus again, uh, we want them to be transformed and changed and they start to become on mission with Jesus. They, come, they start to become a, a Christian who happens to live in America, not an American who happens to be a Christian. And they start putting the things of God first before they start putting the things of themselves first or their country first or all those things. They, they ask, what, what God, what should I do? What would you have me do? What do you want me to know? And they start being transformed and they start caring about what Jesus cares about. Have you thought about that? Am I caring about what Jesus cares about? Is that a question that keeps you up at night? Am I loving the way that Jesus loves? And that's what I'm aspiring to do. I'm a long ways off, and my wife's over there. She can uh, confirm that. But that's what we're all aspiring to do. And you know what I love about Jesus and the way that Adam ended the message last week? You know what I love about Jesus is uh, Jesus didn't stand on the banks of the Jordan River and just be like, all right, I'll wait for you guys to get all cleaned up and get it right, and then you can come with me. None of us would be here. Jesus jumps into the Jordan River. He jumps into the chaos of the world and gets baptized, we learned last week, to fulfill all righteousness. He gets authority. He gets confirmed in his identity of who he is. The Father in heaven said, this is my sign, well pleased. And then he just waits on the sideline for people to accept him. No. Then he shows us what it looks like. He shows us how to love like we've never loved before. He shows us mercy and grace that we've never, ever experienced before. He declares war on the chaos that was happening in that world. So we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 4. This is these temptations. And can you imagine what kind of week I had since I'm teaching on temptation? 
Can you imagine the things that are going on in our lives when you're working on a talk on temptation? So let's dive right into the text. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. And here's what it says. This is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Pause. I forgot to say something really important. Here's what I want you to be thinking about as we're reading this and as you're experiencing the message today. What are your couple biggest temptations? What keeps coming back into your life that is a temptation, that is drawing you farther away from God's love, from his mercy, from his grace? What is something that that keeps happening in your life that you're just like, no, that separates you from Jesus? I want you to pray that God with me would reveal what those are. All right, so Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Me too. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city, and he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourselves down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, And they will lift up your hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, as is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he said, all of this I will give you. He said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. It's the very word of God, Matthew, the good news, according to Matthew. So this is good news. This is really good news. Remember who we're talking to. Matthew is a tax collector, like the lowest of the low. He gets mentioned that, that, that Jesus even eats with tax collectors and sinners. And so Matthew is definitely the feeling like he's an outcast, he's an outsider, but he's still Jewish, and he's talking to this Jewish audience. He's putting so many connections into the text here for the people that are listening to this that it'll just blow your mind, and we'll hopefully come across some of those today as we walk through this but he is dropping hints all the way through here as the story moves forward. And as soon as a Jew would be taken somewhere in this text, and he's taken to the wilderness, he would be taken to what he knows about the wilderness and what he knows about God's word. And he would think of another time when his people, and here's the other thing, Uh, In the Jewish culture, even to this day, they're not like, you know, they're like, hey, remember the American Revolution when they fought in the Revolution? You remember when we had the Vietnam War and they fought in the Vietnam War and they, like, there's all this distance from it? They personalize it. This is what happened to us, even if it was 1,400 years ago. And so they're taking this to heart and they're thinking about what happened in the wilderness last time? What happened to us in the wilderness? Where did we go? Uh, How did we do I remember this thing about 40 years in the wilderness. I remember this guy who was, who was Moses. And I remember like they were waiting to go into this promised land, but they, they had to wait a little longer. They were a little hard-headed. They kind of missed it. And so they would be thinking about this. Oh, wait a minute. Did he just, he just connected Jesus to Moses? I wonder how, I wonder how he's going to do. I wonder how he's going to do in comparison to that story. So that text about Jesus was led uh, by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and night, he was hungry. Deuteronomy 8, 
Verse two, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. And they're sitting on the edge of their seats and like, oh, is this the one? Like we're trying to keep his commands. Is he gonna, is he gonna overcome this? Jesus is being tested. I wonder how it will go. Now let's talk about this first temptation that we have. Who in here has ever fasted before? Like on purpose, not for a diet, but like you're fasting and praying. You're like, I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna, right? How'd you feel after like 24 hours? Eh, kind of cranky. I was hangry, right? And if you fasted longer than 24 hours, you're probably pretty rare. When you talk about 40 days, like Jesus had the basic temptations. He felt pain. Did he not feel pain as a human on this earth when he came down and put on flesh? Did he not feel the nails going through his hands and his feet and being whipped and beaten? He felt pain. He felt hunger pain. He had fleshly pains just like we have fleshly pains. And so he comes out of this time and he's hungry. And the devil says, hey, if you are, who you say you are, make these into bread and feed yourself. And Jesus responds with the text. It's built up in him. A man does not live on bread alone, but on the very word of God. How are you feeling? Are you full with the very word of God as a follower of Jesus? These temptations that God's maybe, that, that are around you that you're thinking about, or maybe when I asked that question earlier, are you able to rebuke those temptations because you're so full of the word of God, you can live on that? Or do you grab at the flesh? Do you cope with, with eating? Do you cope with drinking? Do you cope with, you know, I got so mad this week, frustrated this week. I, I said the word that I don't like to say. And I threw my phone on the bed because I didn't want to break it. I'm a good steward of it. Very important to me. But I got so mad. And as soon as I said it, I was like, no, 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 no. And I said it in front of somebody that I'm trying to mentor. So then I looked like an extra donkey. And then a couple minutes later, I looked at him and I said, I'm, I'm sorry. Now, I'm not trying to say like my biggest sin is that I cuss or have cussed. Like I got giant ones. But I'm working, like I'm working towards like not doing that. And I noticed I'm just more on edge. Even last night as Carrie and I were preparing for a day, I'm on edge and she could kind of tell like what's going on. Like you're a little shorter, you're a little impatient, you're a little thing. And I'm like carrying all of these things that are of my flesh. And so how am I living on the word of God so Jesus is tempted with the basic thing of food. You know, doesn't your God care for you? Planting seeds. Doesn't he even care for you? Like that wouldn't have happened if God loved you. You ever thought that? If God really loved me, then that wouldn't have happened. He serves me. He gives me stuff. Can't you tur turn these worthless stones? I'm hungry, God. So let me ask you, do you trust God to take care of your basic needs? I put my trust in God, my Savior. You're the one who will never fail. That's why I don't have any worship team. I listened to that this morning. I needed that song this morning as I was preparing things. Do you put your trust in God? Do you learn to listen and trust God's voice above what your eyes are telling you? Deuteronomy 8.3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which is neither for you nor your ancestors had uh, known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I kind of like the sneaky part of this attack too, where immediately, so, so Satan, uh, Jesus, uh, he gets baptized and gathered. And what's the next story? Fist fight with the devil. Like there's no like warming up and like he, he's like he knows who he is and he immediately goes on the offense and he goes in and he goes into chaos, this kingdom that the devil's playing around in and he immediately goes at him. And what's one of the first things he does? There's this, yeah, the food thing. But if you really are 
the son of God, he immediately goes to guns, like top, like, uh, like top Gun, if you know that movie, go to guns. He goes to guns on Jesus' identity. The very identity that Jesus just accepted in the chapter before. Let me ask you this. Is your identity being attacked? And you know who is the most, the biggest offender of attacking your identity? You. You're the biggest offender of attacking your identity. And you'll talk to yourself and say, and, I, and there's times when I'm here and I'm just like, I want to run. I want to run away from this responsibility. I'm not all of these things. And I wonder if Satan's going to attack Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on his very identity. I wonder if there's not an identity attack going on in your life. How does he attack you? He attacks me and says, Josh, you, you are what your, what your sins are. It's not something you did, but it's actually who you are, Josh, now. No, I, I messed up and I cussed a little. Have you seen that T-shirt? It's awesome. It says, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Like, I don't want to be that person. That's not a good representation of who God is. That's not who I am. Don't buy that T-shirt. Check that. Strike that from the video. That's why you should stick to your notes, Josh. Um, so what is your identity? Who are you? Well, hi, I'm Josh Gray. I'm a pastor. Nope. False. Hi, I'm Josh Gray. I'm, I'm a husband of, of Carrie Gray. True. Hi, I'm Josh Gray. I'm a son of the God Most High. He has wonderful plans in my life. And he has wonderful plans in all of the lives of the people who choose to acknowledge him and follow him. Here's what he says. He says, you're a new creation. I'm just going to go through uh, bullets here. New creation. You're a new creation. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. I had to kill it again this week. Uh, and see, the new has come. Use the text to kill it. Josh, you're a child of God. John 1, 2. But to, uh, to all who received him, he said, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name. I believe in his name. I'm a child of God. I'm a branch of the true vine, John 15, 5. I'm a friend of Jesus, John 15, 15. I'm justified and I'm redeemed, even though I keep messing up, Romans 3, 24. I'm an heir. I don't know if you guys know this. I'm kind of a big deal. I'm super, super wealthy. I have a lot of things that I steward. I'm an heir to the kingdom of God. And so are you. I'm a sanctified saint. First Corinthians one, first uh, Corinthians uh, chapter one, verse two. I'm a temple of the Holy spirit. First Corinthians six, 19. I'm a member of Christ's body. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. First Corinthians 12, 27. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm chosen. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed and forgiven. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm made alive in Christ. I'm raised and seated with him in a heavenly place. I'm God's workmanship. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm no longer a slave, but I'm free. When your identity starts to get attacked, you need to know who you are. Temptation is coming. God knows your weak spots. Does it, it's weird how he always goes back to the same weak spots. Or not God, but Satan knows your weak spots. Because like he goes back to those weak spots and tries to like dig in there, see if there's something in there. And you have to root him out of there. And you're not welcome there. So when, when that happens, I need to be prepared. I need to follow what Jesus says. I need to know what God thinks about me. And I do this by communicating with my Father in heaven. I do this by understanding his word. Second temptation he goes again and he says, prove your identity. If you really are the son of God, throw yourself off this high spot. He won't let you get hurt. How many people have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior in here? If you want to, like most of us, cool. It's a church. That happens. That happens. We all have something in common. Some of you don't. Some of you are checking things out. You're like, I don't know. You guys are weird. We are. And so when you accepted uh, uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, were you ever tempted again? 
Oh, yeah. Like, did you ever have problems? Did you ever uh, mess up and go up and down? Like, the temptation comes back. And it's almost like there's a retelling of a story. When I think about the time when somebody was tempted, it almost takes me to Genesis chapter 3. And there's almost an identity crisis and almost some interesting wording here. Did God really say... Who said that again? Was it the serpent that said, did God really say you shouldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Did he really say, are you sure? You know why he said that? Because he doesn't want you to be as powerful as him. He doesn't want you to know all the things that he knows because you can handle it. You can handle all the weight of the world on your shoulders. This is a story that's repeated again and again, but what, how do we do? How did we do? How did Adam and Eve do on that one? It was a curveball in the dirt, and they swung and missed. It was bad. But what does Jesus come back, and what does he do? How does he do? He crushes that out of the park. He overcame the things that the original design couldn't overcome. That sounds familiar. Did God really say that? Prove who you are. Where mankind fell before, Jesus does not. We also learn that the devil is familiar with the text. The devil is familiar with the text. There's people at churches that were like, I've met before, that were like, they had all of this information about the Bible in their head. And if I had like a location question, I was like, hey, what's that one story about this one thing? Oh, do you mean, do you mean Ezekiel 5-7? And they had like things memorized, but it all stayed in their head. They were a walking encyclopedia. They were Google before Google. But they couldn't relate their way out of a paper bag. They were actually dangerous with the text and giving it to people who couldn't eat that text at the improper time. They were relationally immature. And so when do you let the text come out of your head and into your heart and transform you and be changed by God's word? Because Satan knows the text and he's not changed by God's word. He's, using, he's trying to use it for evil. If, that who's you, if that's who you say you are, then prove it. Jump down from here, and you, the angels will take care of you. And then the last temptation here, the deceiver claims power that he does not have. I will give you all of this. Takes him to the highest point. I'll give you all of this. Look at the splendor of all. I will give you all this stuff. How can he give it to Jesus? Whose is it? It's not his. And it's only his when you give it to him in your life. When you give Satan dominion in your heart, when you give him dominion over your mind and over your thoughts and all of those things, you will be tempted and you will fail. And sin is painful and it doesn't just hurt you. It hurts those that you love. And so when you think about the temptations that are going on in your life, do you have ever, anybody ever been tempted with power? If I just had more power, like look, look at Rome. It's like just more, just a little bit more power. Just a little bit more. If you just had, if, if you had this, if you ever said, if I had this, then I would be, you're tempted. So he tries to tempt him with power. And Jesus crushes that power. And he's like, hey, I'm not going to fall down and worship you. I will not stay lost in the desert for 40 years. This fight is on, and the fight is on now. The kingdom has come near. It is here and now, and I am active and engaged in it, and I'm going to create an army of people, and I wish that none will be lost, and this thing's going to go rampant, and they're going to be like a billion Christians maybe. The kingdom is here, and it's now, and he announces it. Anybody uh, like uh, that sinful movie, Bull Durham, baseball movie? Dang it, I'm so old. Or you're all much cleaner than I am. Okay, watch the edited version. I'm, I'm announcing my presence with authority. You're going to do what? I'm going to announce my presence with authority. And he tries to throw a fastball. Jesus is announcing his presence with authority, except his fastball is a strike. And he announces his presence with authority, and he starts creating this movement that we're going to learn more about in the coming weeks. But he goes right into the teeth of the devil, and he sticks it to him right away. And you, with God's word, with his power in your heart, Knowing where your strength comes from, you can battle those temptations that are in your mind. 
You can overcome those things that are taking you and other people away. Any of your temptations ever take anybody else away from the path as well? Yeah. Bummer. I'm raising my hand. I'm sure none of you guys had to, but. So we got to be careful. We got to be careful with understanding God's word. We got to be careful in examining our hearts. Who gives him the power? Who gives Satan the power in your life? Not rhetorical. Who gives it to him? We do. You entertain those thoughts. We entertain those things. We give him power. We let him sneak his way in. And he's a sneaky son of a gun. He's a deceiver. He wishes for you to be destroyed. He's trying to separate you. He's trying to separate you from God's people. He's trying to get you out on the outside, which is why we bang community here all the time. Community, 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 community. So you get on the outside, you're, you're in rough shape. You know, I did, I had a heavy week this week. You know, the, 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 after I had uh, talked to my wife, you know, the first phone calls I made? I called my elders. I immediately called my elders. And I said, hi, I've got a rough thing here. Would you be able to pray with me? Would you be able to think about this? I want you guys to, like, I can't carry this weight by myself. I need your help. It wasn't about the cussing thing. Sorry, Dwight. <laughs> that, was a new, that was a new revelation. So who gives him power in your life? Well, you do. And why would you give him any power? Why does he have any spot or any place in your life? He's lying. He's trying to take you down a path. He wants to kill and destroy you and your family. He wants you divorced. He wants your kids to be lost and lonely. He wants them to have a disconnected dad and a stressed out mom. He wants grandparents to think that they're old and they can't help anymore. He wants young folks to think that everything is okay. Everything is permissible. You do what you want to do. It's just flesh stuff. You know, everybody's doing it. The devil has great power and he's an excellent deceiver in this world. If you are separated from Christ and Christ models how we combat, combat the devil, you can resist and you can help others resist. Do not put the Lord, your God to the test as you did in Massa. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. Guess where those lead? Guess where the God of money leads? He leads to the God of power. And guess where the God of power leads? He leads to the God of abuse. And guess where the God of abuse leads? He leads to the God of divorce. He leads to the God of, of pain and sorrow and all those things. So you got to be careful which gods you're following. Maybe do a God check in your life. So Jesus, we see these temptations. We see him being tempted with his very flesh. We see his identity questioned. We see him given the opportunity to seize some fake power. And he's able to overcome all those things because he gets in the chaos with us. And he is in your chaos too. So as we get ready for communion, if you missed it, you could, you could grab it, or we'll have our guys, Ron will do it, Dennis will do it, raise your hand, we'll get you communion. But we're going to take our sweet time. I left us 42 extra seconds. We're going to take our sweet time with communion today. Raise your hand if you need it. But we're going to let the Holy Spirit, we're going to let him, he does what he wants. Uh, he is in this room. He is in your heart. I'm going to wrestle down these things that maybe are pulling and separating you from your spouse or from your, your parents or from uh, your children. And we're going to wrestle these temptations down and we're going to bring them to the very foot of the cross. And we're going to ask for his power, his glory, his, his, his revelation to help us crush those. And maybe they don't need to be kept in secret anymore. Maybe you need to find a safe place where you can have somebody else who's going to put on the armor of God with you. And they're going to walk with you, but you can be free from the temptations. You can choose to be free from those things. You can choose to help other people get free from those as you've figured out a way to get free, free from them. Why would you stay in them? Satan wants to paralyze you. 
He wants you inept. He wants you to just be, be a lukewarm Christian. Maybe he's lost you to the kingdom of heaven, to this idea of you said the prayer with your mouth and you got baptized and everything's fine now. But that's, that's, that's not what you were baptized for. You're baptized to be a kingdom of priests. You're baptized to go out and make disciples. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, then maybe we should just stop. I don't know how to use YouTube. I figured it out. And you can figure out the things that are really important to you. And we're here to help and we're here to model and engage what that looks like the best that we can. You get to see my failures. We bring things to the light. We let God come in and examine those things and we bring them to the foot of Jesus. So pray with me. Hold on to your communion and pray with me. Father, I pray, I ask that you are here. You are here. You have come upon us. Every single individual person here, I would ask that you would knock on the door of their heart. That the thoughts that are coming into their mind now are are from you. You start checkmarking the lies that they're believing and replacing them with what you think about them. Lord, I desire to be free. I desire to be free in Christ. Lord, I desire to have real relationships, relationships that matter. A place to be vulnerable, a place to be real, a place to be molded and changed, to be made more like you. Lord, I know you've had to handle some of my temptations. I had to bring them to you. I had to acknowledge what they were. And through your grace and mercy, you've helped me walk through those. And I know that I have more that you're helping me walk through now. And I know I'm not doing it right all the time. But I want to. I want to. So I come to you, Father God, and I lay these things at your feet, just one or two of them. You can have all of mine, but if I could think of all of them, I would give them all to you, but you know what the big ones are for me right now. Take me to your word, Lord, where I can rebuke those. Clean me with your blood, Lord. Cover me. Give me the strength and power and the wisdom to use it the way that Jesus used it, to submit to you in all things, to make my thoughts obedient to you. I don't want to sin in my head anymore against you. I don't want to sin with my hands out in the community against you, Lord, or against my wife or my kids. I want to give an accurate picture of what you look like. Help me. Let this be something that just transformed, not just from our minds, but into our hearts. So we're coming to the table, Lord. We're coming to the table that you prepared for us to deal with all of these things. <laughs> Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, <clears throat> He took the bread and he broke it and he looked at his guys and he said, this is my body. This is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember your victory over death. We remember your victory over Satan's temptations. Help us to be Christ-like. Help us to be little Christ and like you. We take this in honor of that. In the same way, After supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant. I'm going to come and do something new. I'm going to fix all these things that had happened beforehand. I am going to cross into the promised land and lead my people to you. This is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it and remember me. For wherever you eat this bread and you drink this blood, you are proclaiming the Lord's death 
until he comes in. And when you proclaim his death, you proclaim death to sin. And so, Lord, we proclaim it with you. Father, thanks for this time. I ask you to just encourage people to dive into your text, to be passionate about you, to learn more about you. Help us flee our temptations.